G'day, welcome to the ADF Insider Essentials channel for another relaxing swim in the application module pool. My name is Chris Muir, I'm a product manager for Oracle's development tools. This is the third in a series of videos to explore the application module pool in ADF business components. In today's episode, we're going to chill out besides the pool by looking at the concepts of passivation and activation. In the previous sessions of the ADF Insider Essentials channel on the application module pool, we talked very superficially about the concepts of passivation and activations of our application modules from the pool. To keep it simple, we ignored much of the underlying detail of how the pool works. However, in this session, we're going to do a deep dive into the life cycle of the application modules in the pool. That is the states an application module transitions through. At its very basic, once an application module is instantiated, it can have three states or statuses, available, unavailable, or referenced. Now, the very easiest way to describe the AM statuses are, available means that the application module instance is ready for use. Unavailable means is, well, yes, it was instantiated at some point, it was available, but currently it's being processed. It's currently checked out to a servlet thread and it's doing some work. Referenced is kind of the other end of that, where the processing is complete, the application module instance is checked back into the pool, then it's pinned there for the future session to return with another request so that that AM, which is referenced, can be returned to that particular session. So let's go into this in even more detail to cement your understanding of the application module statuses. And an available application module is an AM in the pool that is available to be used by a session. When an AM is first instantiated, this is the default status, available. As you'll likely appreciate, setting JBO AM pool in a pool size to something higher than the default value of zero will result in that many available AMs in the pool when ADF starts. When a new session requests an application module, an available AM is said to be checked out of the pool and is then transitioned to an unavailable status. While the servlet thread is processing the session request, the application module will remain in an unavailable status. This protects the application module from being reused while it is in the middle of being processed. Ripping the AM out underneath the processing request for the JSF lifecycle, you would probably agree would be a messy outcome. Let's just describe that diagrammatically to assist what you've learned so far. So a session request will be received that requires an application module instance. The application module pool will check for an available application module instance in the pool. Now possibly an available application module already exists thanks to the jbo.ampool.init pool size parameter or a previous session has timed out or logged out making a previously active application module a candidate for reuse. If there is an available application module instance, the current session request will check out the application module from the pool, marking the AM as unavailable, and then we'll complete the processing on the AM. Alternatively, if we return to the point where the process is attempting to attain an unavailable AM and there is none available, what happens then? In this case, the AM pool checks how many AMs are in the pool. If this is under the jbo.recycle threshold that we talked about in the last episode, it will then instantiate a new available application module instance, then allow the session thread to check out the AM, mark it as unavailable and continue to process the request. Now there's obviously a discussion what happens if the AM pool is equal to or greater than the JBO recycle threshold, and this leads to a discussion on passivation and activation. Yeah, we haven't talked about the third status here yet, reference. So let's talk about that and then return to the conversation on passivation and activation. So as a reminder, the reference status has to do with when application modules are returned to the pool. So when a servlet thread has completed the processing of a session request, or it has one or more application modules checked out from the pool and their status is unavailable, those application modules are then checked back into the pool, checked in to the pool so they can be reused. 
Remember, one of the reasons we have the application module pool in the first place is so we can share the application modules as a resource. When the application module is checked into the pool, assuming the pool is using the default release mode, and this is the default behavior that we're talking about here, we won't talk to the other release modes in this set of presentations. The application module is checked in with a status of referenced, which is another way of saying stateful. What this status infers is if the same session returns at a later point, the preference of the pool is to give that session the same application module that is marked as referenced in the pool. This will provide faster throughput for the user session as the application module is already pre-initialized with all the application module state as for that session from the previous request and response. It's also worth noting, if the user session that the application module is pinned or referenced by times out or logs out, the framework will reset the application module at some point. For log out, it's instantaneous. For timeout, it's obviously after a certain amount of time. And the application module will be made available in the pool again for reuse. So now we've covered the complete life cycle of an application module from a request to a response. But returning to our diagram from earlier, we haven't covered the scenario where there are no available AMs in the pool and we've exceeded the JBA recycle threshold. What happens then? Well, what happens then is if a new sessions request, so we've got a brand new session and we've just received a request from them, is received, and the total amount of application modules in the pool is greater than or equal to the JBO.recycle threshold, and all the application modules in the pool are currently referenced, so there are none available, they're all referenced, what will occur is the most least recently used referenced AM becomes a candidate for passivation. And we're looping around to the discussion now on passivation and activation. In the previous episodes, we ignored much of the detail on how passivation and activation works and when it occurs. Now that we have a clear understanding of when passivation occurs, let's dig into a little bit more detail about the act of passivation, what actually gets passivated, what settings you can change to influence its behavior, and what happens upon activation. As we know, passivation is designed to offload state of an application module to a persistent store, such as a database by default, files and more, and we'll talk about the different persistent stores in a moment. In passivating the application module and the relating objects, that is the entity objects and the view objects and more, or their state, their current state is pushed to the persistent store for later activation if the session returns with another request. The data or state is converted to XML, which is somewhat similar to the process of serialization of a Java object or marshalling, if you know what those terms mean. But as noted, the serialization results in an XML document. At the end of the process, once the AM is successfully passivated, the application module is reset, then marked as available to be used by another session. Hey, that's why we passivated it in the first place. Conversely, when we receive another session request, assuming the relating application modules aren't in the application module pool, but rather the AM pool discovers that the AM is currently in the persistent store as a row in the PSTXN table if the da default database store is used, the application module pool will go through the process of obtaining an available AM by passivating another least recently used referenced AM in the pool or instantiating an AM as we described earlier on, then activating the state of the passivated AM into the available AM that we just obtained. So the reverse process occurs where the XML document is retrieved from the persistent store. The XML is unmarshaled into the available AM, which is now checked out, marked unavailable for the session, instantiating the AMs, the EOs and the VOs state as they were before they were passivated. Then the row in the passivation store is deleted. So a really fair question, a valid question at this point is, what is exactly passivated? Passivation includes transactional data changes, such as new records stored in the entity object cache, modified entities, and deleted rows. There's also an amount of non-transactional data stored. 
This includes a lot of data or state around view objects, including the current row indicator, any new rows and their position in the view object, view criteria applied to the view object and the bind variable parameters, flags indicating whether the row set has been executed or not, range start and size, access mode, fetch mode and size, any view object custom data, transient view object attributes if configured, and select from where and order by clauses if created dynamically. Now I won't go through the need to passivate all of these, but let's pick on a couple. Why is the view object current row indicator stored or passivated? If it wasn't passivated over request for a user session, the user would see the current row in a table, for example, resetting from what the user had selected in the previous request back to the first row in the next request. Obviously, if we haven't passivated the current row across requests, we're always going to go back to the first record. Now, did you notice something ADF Business Components doesn't passivate? It doesn't passivate the actual queried rows themselves. They are only passivated if they are updated or deleted or a new record is created. ADF Business Components doesn't passivate the actual queried rows, because as you can probably appreciate, that could be a huge amount of rows depending on how you built the application, how you've tuned the view objects and so on. As such, during the process of passivation and activation, it would be a much slower operation affecting the user's throughput. It's just not desirable. However, because it does not actually send the queried rows to the database, there is an implication about this. When an application module is activated in a subsequent request for a session, which can be seconds, minutes, or even hours later, depending on how you've configured your timeouts, on activating the application module and the VOs and the EAs, it will, firstly, need to re-execute view object queries to get the rows it had previously had for the user. So there is an associated cost of requiring the data on activation. Secondly, if another user has subsequently updated records in the view object query set in the database, from the current user's perspective, if they do actually notice, sometimes they won't, some of the data will be magically updated upon the next response from the server. In other words, ADF is not read consistent. It doesn't guarantee a cross request for a user that all records they query are consistent from a single point of time. And finally, third, as another user can have inserted records in the view object query set from the database before the current user's record, this can result in the user's current row moving in the query set based on the order by clause. This is why the primary key is so important on view objects and entity objects in ADF business components. To restore the current row, ADFBC requires the primary key, not the row number, to place the user back on the correct record after an activation. Okay, let's just take a step back and just reinvestigate one of the questions that we thought we already answered. To recap, let's just ask, when is an application module passivated? Now, as we'll remember, the primary reason for an application module to be passivated is when we've received a new request from a new session and all the application modules in the pool are currently referenced, so there's no available AMs, and we've more AMs than the recycle threshold. At this point, an existing referenced application module is passivated to the store. And once passivated, the application module state is reset and then the AM is given to the new session that requires an application module. In this way, as the passivation occurs, as a result of a new request from a new session, the passivation cost is worn by the new session. Alternatively, the activation cost will be worn when the original session for the application module that was just passivated comes back and requires its application module state to be recreated or basically activated from the passivation store. There are, however, other reasons that application modules can be passivated. Now, we'll look into this in much more detail in later, later episodes, but just to make you aware now, here are some of the reasons to complete the discussion on passivation and activation. If you've built an application that requires failover support, basically the passivation store in the database can be used for failover by actively passivating each request at the end of its response. 
and allowing other nodes in our mid-tier to activate that state if the original mid-tier or the middle tier application server node dies. To make use of this capability, you need to turn on jbo.dofailover, which is by default turned off. Now note, not all users, or I should say all customers, require this failover uh, functionality, and this is why it's turned off by default. Alternatively, the option jbo.ampool.doampooling, which is by default true, it is designed to turn on the whole AM pooling mechanism. If you set this to false, instead the pool won't be created at all. And what happens is every application module will automatically be passivated and reactivated on each request response cycle. Why does this option exist? Well, it exists for testing purposes. And Oracle recommends you regression test your applications with this option, JBO AM pool do AM pooling set to false to detect passivation bugs in your code. However, no, Oracle does not support this option being false in production systems. So don't forget to set it back to true before deploying to production. Finally, the options jbo.doConnectionPooling and jbo.txn.disconnect underscore level is set to true and zero respectively will result in active passivations upon the end of each request. However, these options are really complicated to explain right now and we'll come back to these in a later episode. Now, another question you probably have at this point, and we did infer to this a little bit earlier on, is where is the application module state actually passivated to? And do we have any control over this? Well, within the AM configuration dialog, the parameter jbo.passivationStore controls the destination where application module instances are to be passivated and activated from. Now its default value is null, but this doesn't imply we turn passivations off. Rather, we'll come back to this null value in a few moments once we've discovered the other options. If jbo.passivationStore is set to the value of database, then the database will be used to passivate the state. Now obviously in passivating to the database, a network round trip is required which does have a minor performance impact depending on the distances and how busy your network is and the database it is. But the flip side is the database is particularly efficient in storing such data and as we talked about earlier on, can provide failover support. By default, the database that is used is the same database the application module connects to through its JWC data source. As developers will have seen in their own developer databases, you can often find that ADF has created the table ps underscore txn and the sequence ps underscore txn underscore sec or seq to allow ADFBC to passivate state 2. ADF creates these or does this the first time it needs to passivate to the database and discovers the object doesn't exist. If for any reason you don't want the database table and sequence to be created in the same database schema as the one the users are connecting to in the database, you can override the jbo.server.internal underscore connection parameter to define a separate Jindy data source for ADF to passivate to. The most common reason to do this is for security reasons, to separate an internal ADF mechanism from the real schema and its data or data. Note, you can also override the ps underscore txn and ps underscore txn underscore sec table and sequence name, though this would be fairly a regular demand by, by changing these parameters as you can see on the screen. As such, from a recommendation perspective, if you are to use the database option, well, it is the recommended, recommended option, I should say, for failover. Next, as mentioned, consider setting the jbo.server.internal connection option to define a different database schema for your PSTXN table and the PSTXN seconds sec sequence objects for security reasons. And finally, set up a database schedule task to run the bc4j cleanup.sql script that is provided by the default jdeveloper installation to periodically clean up dead sessions in the PSTXN table. Questionably, how do records get left in that table, the PSTXN table? Well, mostly it's thanks to developers killing the middle tier running ADF applications, 
where something has been passive added to the database, but then the user kills the ADF application or the server, and ADF doesn't have a chance to clean up after itself. The reason you'd likely see this in a production system is, well, the overall application server has crashed, which definitely isn't desirable, but again, that cleanup script can help you tidy things up after the fact. The next passivation option to consider for JBO.passivation store is file. This option, file, instead of passivating to a database, will passivate the application module instances to the application server's file system. The directory is defined by the parameter jbo.temp tmp dir. Or, if that is not set, user.dir of the current application server operating system user will be used. The files that are created take the form bc, then a sequence of characters to uniquely identify the file, followed by the suffix of bcd. Now, this option, jbo.passivationStore equals file, is faster than a database passivation, as no round trip to a database is required. Yet, as you might remember, one of the primary reasons to use the database for passivation is failover. Yet, this option can be used for failover too, if multiple application servers share a file system. However, note this is a complex setup for WebLogic Server, and for the majority of customers, the minor speed gain versus that of just using the database is not worth the administrative and setup cost. Putting aside failover, this option is specifically suited to sites that have single node solutions or no cluster where failover is required. Ultimately, as the overhead of the database round trip is avoided, this solution will work again a little bit faster than the database solution. We're not talking about huge differences here, but you will have a minute benefit. Of course, if you do pursue this option, just like the database, you need to set up a periodic job to clean up dead passivated files in the file system if the developer has killed the application server or the application server has crashed. The last option we need to talk about for JBO.passivation store is the default value that we mentioned earlier, that being null. In this case, ADF will detect the type of database connection being used. If it encounters an Oracle or a DB2 connection, it will default to using the database, JBO.passivation store equals database option. Alternatively, if it isn't an Oracle or a DB2 connection type, ADF will default to a file passivation store for other connection types. Have a note, if you decide to change the jbo.seeker build property, which is out of scope for this set of recordings, there are some boundary conditions where ADF BC will change the passivation store destination. In this case, you're highly recommended to consult the documentation around the JBO SQL Builder option and undertake proof of concept testing to ensure you understand what is actually being used in terms of the passivation store. In saying all this, for the majority of customers who use an Oracle database and leave the JBO passivation store to null, the Oracle database will be used as the passivation store and the discussion doesn't have to get any more difficult than this. Now, as we have covered, we have noted that passivation and activation does have a performance impact. While we do want our applications to scale out to as many users as possible, there is an associated IO and network overhead, depending on if we're passivating to the database or to a file, with the act of passivation and activation. So while we can scale out the number of users, passivation and activation will impact the average session throughput. But let's be very specific here. We're talking about the average across all sessions, all sessions throughput. If we've tuned our JBO recycle threshold correctly, the most active sessions will never leave the pool. They will never get passivated or activated, and therefore they won't get hit with this IO or network overhead. So their throughput will be extremely good. Yet those inactive application modules, 
who we have less concern about serving fast as they are inactive and slow between requests. They will suffer slower throughput as passivation and activation cycles occur to push them off to the database as example and bring them back when the session request occurs. So arguably, the key to tuning the scalability versus user throughput of an ADF system is all about the jbo.recycle threshold and controlling the number of passivations and activations. So how do we determine if our pool is tuned efficiently for throughput? Well, by monitoring the pool, the number of passivation and activation events, or the number of check-ins and outs from the pool. How do we do that? Well, guess what? That'll be covered in a further episode of the ADF Insider Essentials videos looking into the ADF BC application module pool. We hope today's swim in the pool has made the AM pool a little less daunting. And we hope in the next couple of episodes with your newfound swimming skills, we get to take you right out into the deep end of the pool to show you how you can keep your head above water with even some more options in configuring the pool. Thanks again for your time today. See you in the next episode. Cheerio.